Hi, everybody. Welcome to our conversation about the evolution of Title VII and changes to 1557. I'm Carrie Shrebeni. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Client Solutions for the South Region, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the evolution of Title VII and its impact on employers and employee benefit plans. I'm Corey Jorben, Chief Compliance Officer for Hubs West Region. I'm going to be focusing on Section 1557 and the changes we've seen with that and how that's going to interact along with Title VII to impact employee benefit plans. Thanks, Corey. So we're going to jump right in. Today's format's going to be a little different. We're trying something new. We hope you enjoy it. Um, Corey and I intend to have a real conversation and talk about how these new rules and this new guidance and new law really impact employers and how they contradict and work together. So we're each going to start with a little bit of foundation about our respective areas and then move into our conversation. This is being recorded. Um, there won't be an opportunity for questions at the end, but you can always reach out to your account managers or your chief compliance officers for help, assistance, and guidance on this or any other hub-related issues, questions, concerns. Okay, so let's talk about Title VII. I want to lay some foundation here. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act was originally passed in 1954 and then updated and revised a bit in 1991. It specifically prohibits discrimination, retaliation, harassment, hostile work environment on the basis of a protected class. You see on the screen those protected classes under Title VII. The class that we're talking about significantly and primarily today is sex, which historically has included pregnancy, gender nonconformity, Equal Pay Act, and sex-related hostile work environment and discrimination. Some examples of prohibited employment actions on the basis of a protected class include terminations, failure to hire, and demotions. The Equal Pay Act, as I referenced earlier, is also controlled by Title VII. It specifically gets its definition of sex from Title VII, along with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination Act. All of these are rules that protect employees from discrimination in the workplace. What's important to understand as we move into our conversation today is that both the Equal Pay Act and Title VII include within its purview things like salary, compensation, benefits, bonus plans, insurance, fringe benefits, and employee benefits. And this becomes really important as Corey picks up in a few more slides and talks about 1557. There are two different ways that an employer may discriminate against an employee in a protected class. One is intentional discrimination. This is much more obvious, much more overt, and it is where an employer intentionally singles out an individual or a group of individual employees on the basis of their protected class. All women get smaller raises, less bonuses, something along that line by way of example. Disparate impact is where an employer had no intention of discriminating against an employee on the basis of their protected class. They launch a very neutral objective rule that by accident, unintentionally, it negatively or adversely impacts a particular protected group of employees. So what is discrimination? Hiring, firing, of course, demotions, reductions in pay. But I think the area where a lot of people are unclear or did not know or understand that Title VII and Equal Pay Act include your employee benefit programs. They include your fringe benefits, compensation, bonuses, classification of employees. So as employers build, design, and deliver employee benefit programs, it's important to ensure that it does not intentionally discriminate against particular classes of employees, but that disparate impact, that's where it gets more difficult to, uh, to wrap your arms around the issues because there could be cases where you build out what appears to be a very objective benefit plan based on certain classifications of employees, but the net impact is that it adversely affects a particular group of employees. So here's an example. Let's say that you run a restaurant 
and all of your servers happen to be female. And you build a benefit program that classes out groups of employees by job function. And it happens to be that servers pay more for their benefits because they get tipped versus a kitchen staff person who does not get tips. Well, the servers all also happen to be predominantly female. That could mean that your benefit program design, your contribution structure has a disparate impact on that population of employees, your servers. So you not only want to be clear that you're not building programs that intentionally discriminate, but you also want to do that what we call disparate impact analysis to be sure that there isn't one group or protected class of employees that's adversely impacted over another based on how you build your programs. The summary of protected classes and a disparate impact analysis can be pretty onerous. These are all protected classes under the variety of laws that I referenced earlier, ADA, age discrimination, equal employment, um, Equal Pay Act, Title VII. So you wanna be particularly attentive to these protected classes as you perform that disparate impact analysis. When we talk about Title VII and we talk about the recent Supreme Court opinion, because that's what we're here to talk about today and how that relates to 1557, I think it's kind of cool to look at how Title VII has evolved since 1964, only most recently looking at Bostock all the way on the far end of this spectrum. But there's been a lot of evolution and a lot of change in how we apply and understand Title VII. For example, did you know that until 1986, we didn't have a single Supreme Court opinion that legitimized that hostile work environment and harassment in the workplace was prohibited under Title VII? So here the law was passed in 64, and it wasn't until the 80s that the Supreme Court said, yeah, hostile work environment's illegal and prohibited by Title VII. Another great example is um, Farragher Ellerth and Onkel Sundowner in 1998. It wasn't until 1998 that the Supreme Court said that a hostile work environment can occur between two people of the same sex or the same gender. So Title VII is a living, breathing regulation that continues to evolve. And most recently, we now see the Supreme Court opinion that we're going to talk about today. Now, as a threshold matter for you guys, it's important to know that the EEOC was ahead of the game when it came to sexual orientation, transgender as a protected class under Title VII. And two years ago, they issued a report from a task force that they convened on harassment in the workplace. And in this report, they specifically said that the EEOC deems harassment and discrimination on the basis of transgender, sex orientation, and sex stereotyping as protected by Title VII. Now, today we see that with the onset of Bostock and the EEOC guidance, that sex stereotyping, gender identity, sex orientation, and of course, pregnancy are all protected under Title VII. Now, the federal courts have really struggled with this. Um, different jurisdictions have had different perspectives and different holdings on litigation. The 11th Circuit, which is the Southeast United States, which is where I am, um, has held historically and continuously that transgender and sex orientation are not protected under Title VII, which is why we needed an answer from the Supreme Court and why the Supreme Court's decision last week is so huge. Because you can see, depending on where you sit in the country, your courts may or may not deem sex orientation and transgender as a protected class. So now we finally have an answer. The Bostock opinion that came out a week ago consolidated three cases, Zarda, Bostock, and Amy Stevens. Both Zarda and Bostock were homosexual males who came out to their employer and subsequently lost their jobs. Amy Stevens was an employee that was originally hired as a male and transgendered while working for, for, for Harris Funeral Homes. The court consolidated all three opinions and found that sexual orientation and transgender are protected classes under Title VII 
and that an employer cannot single out an employee based on their transgender status or their sexual orientation and take adverse action against them, just like they can't fail to, refuse, fail to hire or refuse to hire or fire somebody because they're male or they're female. I'm gonna hand this off to Corey now to lay some foundation for you on section 1557, and then we're gonna put these puzzle pieces together for you. Thanks, Carrie. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about section 1557 and the evolution that we've seen with that. So the background of section 1557 is that it was at first enacted as part of the Affordable Care Act, and it contains a provision that prevents plans from uh, essentially discriminating on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Now, one of the big catches here is that it only applied to covered entities. Well, who's a covered entity? So first we had organizations that receive money directly from the Department of Health and Human Services. So that's going to include your medical providers, your home health agencies, your assisted living facilities. I've also seen it include a number of other employers that just based on how they do business, they end up getting money from the Department of Health and Human Services. So I've seen it apply to municipalities, private corporations, school districts. Again, a lot of times the answer really just depends on whether or not the organization actually receives that funding from Health and Human Services. The second group that it impacted would be plans issued by fully insured carriers. That's because Section 1557 was pretty wide in scope. So the major health insurance carriers all received money from Health and Human Services. So it, Section 1557 extended to the plans issued by those uh, by those carriers too. So enforcement uh, of Section 1557 was actually blocked by an injunction that was issued way back in 2016. So we are kind of uh, essentially in this holding pattern for quite a, a period of time where we had this law on the books, but any enforcement was blocked. Um, and then also down at the bottom of this slide, we have that this included some really onerous communication responsibilities for employers. So we're going to talk about that a little bit coming up. So let's talk about what was actually included in here. So in providing health coverage, these covered entities, here's a whole list of things that they could not do. So deny, cancel, limit, or refuse to issue or renew health insurance coverage, um, adding claims limits, adding other thresholds that, um, you know, essentially hoops that individuals might have to jump over in order to gain treatment. And all of this, of course, was banned on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. You'll notice some of these are the protected classes that Carrie had mentioned earlier with Title VII. So hopefully now you start to see the overlap between 1557 and Title VII. It also included some transgender or sexual stereotyping type protections. So again, we see these very similar to the ones that we just mentioned. Covered entities could not deny or limit coverage or claims for services provided to transgender individuals, um, especially focusing on where an individual might have been assigned one sex at birth and was now uh, you know, a member of a different sex. So this is really what Section 1557 was designed to do, provide these protections for employees on the basis of not only all those traditional protected classes, but also this expanded view of transgender individuals and sexual, sexual stereotyping also included as a protected class. Now we're on to that notice requirement. So section 1557, it required notices and specifically taglines. So these taglines were essentially non-discrimination statements in at least the top 15 languages spoken by individuals with limited English proficiency. So the whole idea here is that even though we think of section 1557 as really focused on gender and sexual orientation, there's also these other uh, requirements included in here, such as communicating to people um, in a language that they can understand. So again, quite an onerous process here for plans to communicate in 15 different languages, um, essentially these non-discrimination provisions. 
Okay, well, of course, we saw an update to 1557 recently. So, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, they issued final, final regulations or new final regulations on June 12th. These final regulations rolled back some of the traditional Section 1557 protections. Now, here in the middle of this slide, we have the rationale for why they did this. They said that the prior rule exceeded its statutory authority, erroneously interpreted civil rights law, led to confusion, and imposed unjustified costs and regulatory burdens on employers. So, what does this all mean? So, first and foremost, they got rid of the definition section. So, this definition, definition section was important because, one, this defined covered entity, and then, two, uh, this also contained the expanded definition of on the basis of sex. For employers, I would say this is a big win. The notice and tagline section have also been removed from Section 1557. So, that's going to lift a huge burden off employers who really struggle with providing these notices and, and taglines. And then, of course, these final regulations, they're going to be effective 60 days after they were issued. So, essentially, we're looking at the middle of August when these will go into effect. So, again, section, section 1557 and now applies to far fewer employers than it did previously. Why? Because they got rid of that definition of covered entity. So, now that scope of who it applies to, only those that actually receive money from Health and Human Services, that's who it's going to apply to from now on. So, that means that fully insured plans where the carrier receives the money from Health and Human Services, but the employer who has that fully insured plan does not receive that money from HHS, they're not going to be subject to it just by virtue of having a fully insured plan. Overall, I would say the biggest win for employers with this is the removal of the tagline requirement. Again, this was really onerous for employers to have to deal with, so I would say this is probably the biggest win. Now, we need to kind of tie this back to Title VII too. So, even though Title VII isn't thought of as a traditional benefit-specific statute, just because it's really wide in scope, benefits are certainly within the scope of Title VII and the Equal Pay Act. So, my thought with this is that we can't just look at 1557 within a vacuum. We need to look at it, of course, in relation to uh, Title VII as well, just because they can't be looked at individually. So, What's the future of uh, Section 15, 7, uh, 1557 going to hold for us? So, um, I would say first and foremost, it's definitely possible that HHS goes back to the drawing board to potentially revise these regulations. It's also worth noticing that uh, Section 1557, it incorporates the federal sex non-discrimination provision from Title IX, not Title VII, so there is a difference. However, courts generally do look at the two in conjunction with each other. Um, Carrie, later on, I'd love your thoughts on whether or not you think it's possible that a court might actually take a different view of the definition of sex on the basis of Title IX as opposed to Title VII. Um, and again, I think the one certainty here is that we are pretty much guaranteed to continue to see legal challenges from all different uh, sources as it relates uh, to 1557 and probably Title VII too. So, what does all this mean for employers? Now, we are on our, our combined next steps because, again, neither of these can be looked at solely in a vacuum. So, Carrie, um, I will let you touch on the Title VII uh, next steps. Well, and I want to go back a little bit too, Corey, because I think what I want to clarify for everyone on the phone, and I need your help to do this, is what's happened with Title VII as compared to 1557. And I want to put this in a little bit of a timeline, too, because on Friday afternoon at, what was it, like 4 o'clock Eastern time, we get the new update on 1557, and then Monday, we get the Bostock opinion handed down. And so on Friday afternoon, we learn that under 1557, health plans no longer have to um, or are no longer required to provide coverage for transgender services or um, other services related to sex orientation or gender stereotyping. And then on Monday, the Supreme Court hands down opinion that says Title VII absolutely unequivocally 
includes transgender, sex orientation, and sex stereotyping under the concept of sex, the definition of sex in Title VII. So you have two laws that seem to go divergent, and how do employers reconcile this? And I think one of the conversations that you and I have been having is how far do we think Title VII goes with respect to its application to employee benefits, right? So certainly I have no doubt that Title VII applies as you identify your plan offering, who in the company is eligible for benefits. But do we think that Title VII actually reaches inside of the health plan and includes the scope of coverage like 1557 did? What do you think, Corey? I don't know. I think it's a tough call. Personally, I would think that there is enough of a connection between the offer and the delivery. Um, I guess what I'm thinking about this in relation to is similar to a disparate impact where you could have this offer that's there, but if it has that impact later on that even if it's unintended, uh, you still have to potentially deal with that. I feel like this is going to be a similar type analysis where even if the offer on its face is going to be non-discriminatory, they're going to look at the delivery of it. So what does it actually look like in practice? That's my thought. Although it's certainly possible that that could be viewed as an expansion of Title VII too, which of course isn't beyond the uh, the scope of the courts to do. Well, and what's also interesting is <clears throat> happening at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, back in January in the state of Florida, there was a lawsuit filed against the Public Defender's Office and the University of Florida based on Title VII and it was plan participants who went through the transgender process and the health insurance plan excluded any coverage for any services associated with transgender. That included the gender dysmor dysmorphia counseling and psychological support, hormone replacement, surgical procedures that the doctors deemed to be medically necessary. And this lawsuit was filed in January on the exact cause of action that you and I are talking about today, which is does Title VII extend into the actual plan design limitations and exclusions, where we know 1557 definitely spoke to those services. So it should be very interesting to see now that Bostock has come down, how this case in Florida evolves and whether or not they get to the central issue. Right now they're battling over motions to dismiss and discovery and who's a proper party and who can actually be sued. But I'd like to see this move into the substantive question, which is, does Title VII speak to the actual coverages built into the plan? Because here's the other challenge. Um, oftentimes, our clients have policies that are form policies developed by carriers, and our clients don't necessarily have the ability to influence that coverage. So it will be interesting to see what happens with those plan designs and programs going forward. Um, what do you think is the, the, I don't want to say the right way to approach, but how do you think our clients can reconcile what appears to be a disconnect between, or even a, a contradiction, right, between 1557 and Title VII? That's a really good question. So I think that they, of course, need to look at both of them. And what they really need to understand is that Section 1557 may or may not apply to them. However, Title VII is going to apply to the overwhelming majority of them. So I feel like this is an example of where a child, you know, asks their mom for a cookie and then their mom says no, and then they ask their dad and the dad says yes. So of course that child is going to go with the answer they wanted to hear, which is yes. But I feel like employers definitely cannot do that here because they need to understand what actually applies to them, what doesn't apply. If section 1557 doesn't apply to them, they can't choose that answer just because they might like it better. Likewise, even if they are a covered entity, they still can't choose Section 1557 uh, because they like that answer in a vacuum without also looking at Title VII. So I think for employers, this ultimately ends up being confusing, but I would just have to say that Title VII is probably going to control as it compares to 1557, which is much more narrow in scope and just specific to health plans as opposed to 1550s or Title VII, which really touches the whole employer-employee relationship. 
All right, and just to clarify for folks on the call that don't know, Title VII applies to employers with 15 or more employees. So when Corey says the overwhelming majority, um, anybody with 15 or more employees is subject to Title VII and likewise to the Equal Pay Act. And so I'm with you, Corey. I think that regardless of what 1557 does or doesn't include or does or doesn't address, Title VII applies to the employer-employee relationship and it ensures that employers do not discriminate in the terms and conditions of the working environment. And part of that includes the benefit plan offering and ostensibly the benefit plan design. So employers really need to ensure not just that their benefit plan offering is built in a way that is not intentionally discriminatory, but when we think about all those protected classes that we addressed earlier, you really want to be sure that it doesn't have a disparate impact. And I would start specifically with your Title VII protected classes, since that's the law specifically that has changed, and that's the law that in particular has changed the definition of sex with respect to discrimination under Title VII. And you want to be sure that your benefit program offerings are not having some kind of unintended negative consequence on the basis of transgender status, sex orientation, or sex stereotyping. Corey, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like employers really need to do that. I think it's a good idea to do anyway. Um, I think that you know, again, it's one thing if we have an intended consequence where we actually have that intent, but because disparate impact looks at unintentional consequences, um, I feel like this does need to be on the radar for employers that are, you know, thinking of, you know, possibly changing their plan designs or implementing some kind of restrictions. And I would say that even employers that are looking to classify their employees, so offering different benefits to different groups of employees probably need to take a look at this too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a good point. And that's something that's really common, right? We so often see employers that build benefit eligibility and benefit contribution structures on the basis of objective classifications of employees, all hourly versus exempt, all field versus office, sales versus administration, whatever your um, bite-sized chunks might be, right? Whatever your classifications might be. And very frequently, I express a concern to clients that I talk to, hey, have you done a disparate impact analysis to be sure that you don't have some kind of unintended consequence for these different categories of classes of eligibility, waiting periods, contribution structures for your benefits. And most benefits people don't get involved in Title VII and don't perform that analysis. And that to me is an area of real risk. Um, if you build a contribution structure, different waiting periods, different kinds of eligibility based on some kind of job-related classification of your employees, I think, especially with this change under Title VII, it's important that you now go back and look at the protected classes of all those folks in those categories to ensure that there isn't one job-related classification that may be predominantly of one grouping of employees that is either being adversely impacted or has some greater benefit than some other groupings of employees to be sure that you don't have a disparate impact on the build and design of your program. Um, I see that happen all the time. Corey, what do you think? Yeah, so I definitely see that where there are uh, potential scenarios that could be having a disparate impact, even if it's a classification that might be allowed, such as hourly or salary or based on geographic differences. I feel like employers do need to take a look at the disparate impact analysis to make sure that it isn't something that is causing a disparate impact, just because, again, it might not even be on the radar because it's not an intended consequence, but it again, could be a potential result. Um, Carrie, I actually have a question for you. What are your thoughts on the expansion of Title VII as it relates to religious employers? Um, I have a feeling that that's going to be one of the things that comes up where employers are saying, well, is there an exemption for religious employers? So what do you think? So I think we're going to get that answer sometime between now and the end of June. Um, there are two cases that are sitting in front of the Supreme Court right now with respect to this very question. I can tell you without those cases being heard where we are today, 
there is no indication that the religious employer exemption has changed as a result of the expansion or the clarification of sex under Title VII. There's nothing in the court opinion that leads anybody to believe that the clarification of Title VII with respect to sex, transgender, and sex orientation somehow undoes or negates the religious employer exemption. Although I think we're gonna get more clarity on that issue in particular once this second set of cases is handed down by the Supreme Court. Interestingly, they likewise consolidated two claims into one case as well. So when we see that answer, it will be two cases consolidated into one opinion. We generally see those opinions come out before the end of June because the Supreme Court session ends at the end of June. So we're waiting to hear, but I think employers that are eligible for and take advantage of the religious employer exemption Definitely talk to your outside counsel, but we haven't seen any indications that that's going to change or has changed as of yet. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, obviously, I think that when whenever new legislation comes out, the first thing that you know employers ask us is, well, are there any exemptions? Everyone's always looking for a way to have something not apply to them. So uh, great point on having to wait for these Supreme Court decisions to really get an idea of whether or not there are some exemptions available for employers. There was a um, cursory reference, it was about three or four sentences in one paragraph in this 172 page opinion, by the way, folks. Um, the majority opinion was about 33 pages. The entire opinion was 172 pages. There were, Corey, something like, 70 pages of appendices attached by the dissenting judges filled with dictionary definitions like webster's definite dictionary definitions it was a fascinating read it was clear to me and my personal opinion for whatever that's worth um that this was a very not heated but these justices seem to feel passionate about the positions that they took because you know you can kind of tell in their writing they were serious about their perspectives and the research that they conducted and it was you know i geeked out over it i enjoyed reading the whole thing um but there was a cursory reference with respect to the religious employer exemption um and gorsuch who wrote for the majority was pretty clear that it's a complicated issue um, and one that the Supreme Court will continue to address and it will continue to evolve over time. But again, even in that cursory reference, there was nothing in there that led, I think anybody I've talked to, any employment lawyers that I've talked to, to believe that the exemption has been nullified or contradicted or withdrawn. So I would stay tuned. I think we're gonna get a lot more clarity from the, this team of justices and from this court in the next couple of weeks as we wait for that opinion to be handed down. And I quite literally, I'm very interested and excited to read that opinion. I'm looking forward to it coming out. I just hope it's not 172 pages. <laughs> I'm, glad you <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned how long the opinion was and all the different footnotes and appendices, because I think that gives people an insight into what really goes into these opinions. Um, oral arguments for the Bostock case happened back in October. Um, yeah. So sometimes people wonder why it takes so long. And obviously there's a ton of work that goes into, uh, you know, writing all those opinions. So I think that's a good takeaway for uh, our audience today. Yeah, and I read, <laughs> yes, I did. I read the transcripts of all those oral arguments um, and they were very lengthy. They were very lengthy oral arguments. It was really interesting to see the kinds of questions that the justices asked. Interestingly, there was a whole discussion during one of the oral arguments about the bathroom issue and gender assignment and transgender, and none of that made its way into the Supreme Court opinion. Um, so it's interesting how much territory they covered in oral arguments and by comparison, how narrow the opinion was. The opinion was very specific, very deliberate, um, and very focused and refined as compared to the scope of questioning and the different avenues that they went down during the oral arguments. So when yeah, we I, talk I, about, go ahead, you go. No, 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 I was just gonna agree with you. Sometimes it's fascinating to read those transcripts. So when we talk about next steps, Corey, and we start thinking about stuff that our clients can walk away with, real tangible, 
concrete things. What are some of your thoughts? And then I'll chime in on the title, title seven piece. So first and foremost, I would look at any kind of exclusions that you currently have in your plan. So I know I work with a number of employers that they exclude gender transition surgery from their plans. They exclude other types of procedures and services too that could possibly cross the line uh, as it relates to you know Title VII and the Bostock decision. Um, I would say that you know definitely keep apprised of what's going on with 1557. Uh, we of course make every effort to keep our clients informed about what's going on, uh, which includes you know any kind of updates that we might see that HHS potentially issues in response to the Bosak decision. Um, I really don't know if they are going to issue any kind of changes or not, or if they're just going to leave things as is. Um, I guess finally, my major takeaway is work with counsel to really understand um, any kind of risk that you might be taking on for exclusions that relate to uh, Title VII. Remember that just because 1557 says now maybe you can do something that you previously couldn't do before doesn't mean you necessarily should and doesn't mean that doing so is without risk, especially as it relates to Title VII. Um, sometimes I hear about employers that want to make certain exclusions in their plans and uh, I think that there's you know kind of a sometimes a disconnect between maybe employers that want to exclude something and understanding the risks associated with that. Um, these days I let employers know that if they exclude something it's possible that this could end up in social media, people might call the local news. Um, these are all things that I've worked with clients that have had to deal with. So I guess it's one thing if you want to make that exclusion. It's another thing if you're prepared to deal with this scrutiny from the public, especially in the court of public opinion and you know, possibly even defend lawsuits related to those exclusions. I guess my question for employers would be, how much of a stand are you willing to take? How passionate are you about making these exclusions that you're willing to, uh, you know, defend yourselves at all costs? So these are all important considerations that I just don't think can be made without working with outside counsel. And Corey, when you talk about specific exclusions, it makes me think about the claims in the complaint in the state of Florida against the Public Defender's Office and University of Florida. And a couple of things in that complaint really stood out for me. And one, two of those issues or two of the facts that the plaintiff's lawyer relied on in demonstrating the discriminatory nature of the benefit plan design was with respect to um, gender dysmorphia, the psychological counseling and hormone replacement therapy. And in the complaint, plaintiff counsel said, you know, if you have any other kind of mental health issue, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety disorders, whatever mental health issue may exist, it's covered under the plan. And employees of those organizations could go see a licensed social worker or a therapist, receive pre prescription drug treatment, antidepressants, anti-anxieties, whatever prescription drugs may be appropriate. Yet the individuals, the plaintiffs in this case, who sought psychological counseling and therapy and support for gender dysmorphia were denied those services, even though they were identified as medically necessary by their healthcare provider. The other exclusion in coverage that I thought was interesting or poignant and stuck out in my mind, maybe because of my age, but hormone replacement therapy, and the plaintiff attorney specifically said, you know, if you're in menopause seeking hormone replacement therapy by way of example, that was covered, but the hormone replacement therapy for the transgender process was not. And it just really resonated with me how disparate that those coverages were, right? And then when we think about mental health parity, you and I were talking about this the other day, what do you do with mental health parity if you're carving out one set of psychological services and not the other. I agree. I think employers definitely have to think about mental health parity too. Um, I can tell you that the Department of Labor, they are auditing related to mental health parity too. So this is something that's on their radar. Um, and of course, I think that 
you know, sometimes we have a tendency to talk about this just as it relates to gender transition surgery, but there's it's much wider in scope than merely that physical transition surgery. Um, when we talk about the hormone replacement therapy and we're dealing with prescription drug claims, and now when we're dealing with counseling too, we have mental health parity come into play. So again, much wider in scope than just the traditional uh, transition surgery. So, and then moving into your employment law or employee relations policies, obviously most employers have handbooks. Many of those handbooks have a few layers of dust on them, probably needed to be updated anyway. Um, it's really important guys that you go back to basics when it comes to your employee handbook, your training and any documentation around Title VII protected classes, discrimination, harassment, hostile working environment, your EEO statement in your handbook. It's really important that you revisit all of these policies, work with outside counsel, work with an HR consulting practice. Certainly Hub has its own HR consulting team in-house that is prepared, ready, willing, and able to assist you with your employee handbooks. But you've got to go back to basics here and be sure that your written policies and your actual practices now take into account the clarified definition of sex under Title VII. That's going to be really important. Those are all really good points. Um, I think that my main takeaway from presenting this is that obviously employers have a lot of different considerations. They might need to go back to the drawing board as it relates to not only their benefit plans, but also uh, their employee handbooks and potentially even some other uh, employee policies that they have. And of course, Hub is here to support and to help. Um, just so everybody on our conversation or our call today knows, Corey and I are also providing a program internally to all of our account managers and all of the folks who support our clients. Um, and so we are here to help you. We are ready, willing, and able to provide the support. And if the issues that you're facing, the challenges, the questions are not something that we can support. Of course, we'll do our best to get you to the right people who can partner with you. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, with that, Carrie, I think we're probably about ready to wrap this up. Um, any closing statements? Um, I think this is a to be continued conversation. I think that this is the beginning of important steps by the EEOC, by our Supreme Court justices to really provide employers with more clarity on the rules and regulations around managing your employment relationships. And whenever you're in doubt, be sure that you're partnering with the experts who are there to support you. I completely agree. This is gonna be an ongoing conversation. It's going to continue to evolve. Um, I feel like every time there's a court decision or new legislation issued, um, it's just met with a million questions. This time is no different. So it's going to continue to evolve, especially as we uh, start to see different court decisions like the religion ones that Carrie had mentioned earlier uh, and the state of Florida one as well. So uh, with that, we'd like to thank everyone for taking part in this presentation and taking the time to view it. Um, hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to, uh, you know, kind of the next phase of these presentations. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.